Hey, thanks for checking out this sermon. It's designed to help you take your next step with Jesus. And if you need additional help on how to do that, we have a next steps page on our website that you can check out. Also, if you haven't been able to attend a service at any one of our campuses recently and participate in the time of giving, you can give anytime you want online by visiting our give page or by texting to give. We hope that God speaks to you in this sermon. Take care. These are questions that you asked us to answer. We compiled the results from a survey we sent out to over 10,000 people. There are a lot of people who, who don't necessarily feel the permission to really struggle with these things and wonder out loud about these things here in church. Let's be gracious as we enter into these topics. Let's be aware of differences. Let's be open to what God might want to teach us. And let's approach each of these weeks with our eyes wide open. We say, I believe. I believe that Christ's death was for me. I believe his resurrection is my resurrection. I believe he paid for my sins. That's actually my hope and prayer for all of us today. That we would experience the Jesus that can and will radically change our lives. Well, hi, Cornerstone. I want to say hi to uh, everyone at all of our campuses at Livermore, at Brentwood, Walnut Creek, Hayward, and in Danville, as well as everyone watching online, and to all of our brothers and sisters in prison. As you've heard, we're in this brand new series where we are answering questions that you asked us. And these are excellent questions because they're going to cause us to grow. They're going to stretch us. They're going to they're gonna make us kind of think about questions we've probably thought about, questions about like just real life. As you heard, these are questions that we sent out to over 10,000 people at all of our campuses all over the East Bay. And uh, we, many of you in this room participated in the survey. So thank you for doing that. That really helped us. If you didn't participate in the survey and you're kind of sitting here going like, man, I wish they answered this question. Well, don't come whining to us because you didn't do anything about that. All right. Today we are uh, answering a very important question. How do I know the Bible is true? How do I know? It's an important question. In fact, a question very similar to this was on Time Magazine. And the question was, how true is the Bible? You see, this is a question that people in the church and outside the church are asking. Another cover to Time Magazine said this, is the Bible fact or fiction? Well, today and next week, we are going to settle this issue because there is so much research on this question. There is so much. In fact, I think one of the hardest parts of, of today and next week is to narrow down what to talk about and what not to talk about. Because you could talk about how the Bible is historically accurate. You could talk about how the Bible is prophetically accurate. That there are hundreds and hundreds of prophecies in the Bible that were foretold way before the events took place. You could talk about how the Bible is thematically unified. How even though it was written over thousands of years by many different authors, there's a common theme woven throughout it. We could talk about how the Bible has withstood attacks from all different angles for hundreds and hundreds of years. And of course, we could talk about the transforming power God's word has had in people's lives. And as Christians, we believe the Bible is God's word. We believe it's the inspired holy word of God. We believe that if you understand the nature and the character of God, that there is no better book to go to than this one right here. We believe that if you understand who Jesus is, what he taught, what he accomplished, that he offers us new life and salvation in him, that this is the book that we should read. And as followers of Jesus, who have given Jesus final say over our lives, this is the book we read to understand how he wants us to live and how he wants us to see the world around us. And so this is an important question for obvious reasons. Now I wanna take a moment just to talk to the parents 
of elementary school, middle school, and high school students, just for a second, okay? The challenge before your kids right now is they are growing up in a culture where truth is subjective. Meaning whatever is true for you is true for you, and whatever is true for me is true for me. And so truth is subjective, right and wrong is subjective. Meaning I could believe that there are hundreds of gods and you could believe that there's just one God and the culture your kids are growing up in would say, you're both right. And the challenge before you is to help your kids take their next step with Jesus, understanding that they're growing up in a culture where people are gonna look at them like they're crazy for believing that the Bible is true. But they're not crazy. In fact, there's great reasons to believe in the Bible, excellent reasons. And people are gonna look at your kids like, you really believe in that outdated book? You really think that's true? And so you get the great privilege and honor to help them figure out that the Bible is indeed true. For all of us today, the goal is that we would walk out of here understanding that this is the most important book for us to understand who God is and how he wants us to live. So let's start with the role of the Bible in our lives. We're gonna look at two verses in 2 Timothy chapter three. And it says this, all scripture, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Well, this sums up our view of the Bible. And as Christians, we understand that the Bible has been given to us so that we can understand the purpose that God has for us, that God wants us to be thoroughly equipped to live out the life he's called us to live. And the Bible helps us with that in four main ways. So first, the Bible teaches you. God shows you that there's a path he wants you to walk on. But the Bible also rebukes you. Well, why would the Bible rebuke you? Well, because as people, oftentimes we can make really dumb choices and we can get off the path. But the Bible also corrects you. God shows you how to get back on the path and the Bible also trains you. It shows you how to stay on the path. So that's how God uses the Bible in our lives. And as followers of Jesus who put a lot of weight on this book, it's very important for us to understand that this is reliable. I mean, after all, this is the book that tells us that all of your past sins, all of your present sins, and all of your future sins are forgiven. This is the book that tells us that if you have a loved one who's passed away and they believe in Jesus, you will see them again. This is the book that tells us that God promises to work all things for good in your life. This is a book that reminds us that there is nothing that can happen to you in your life that would separate you from God's love. And so it's very important for us to understand, is this credible? Is this real? Is it true? It's a good question that we're going through. Now, uh, I wanna give you several proofs today that'll help you understand the reliability and the truthfulness of the Bible. Sometimes Christians will quote the Bible to prove that the Bible is true. And outside critics, when they hear that, they're skeptical. And, and, that, and it's okay for them to be skeptical of that because it's considered circular reasoning and it's kind of considered illogical. I mean, if the Bible is what's in contention, then why would we quote the Bible? But however, if we can show that the Bible is a reliable document, accurately recorded and transmitted throughout history from God to us, then we can build a very strong case that the Bible is indeed true. So let's dive in. The first proof that the Bible is a reliable historical book 
is the manuscript evidence. That's our first proof. Now, you may have heard people say, well, I'm sure the Bible was right the first time it was written. But it's been passed down from generation to generation from generation that there's probably so many mistakes in there. Or you'll hear people say like, well, I, I'm sure the Bible was right at one point, but there's been so many things that were added and, and taken out and fabrications and things that we're not so sure are true. So we can't really trust this. Well, when we hear people talk like that, chances are these are people that probably haven't uh, studied this very much. They probably haven't taken the time to read about this because there's overwhelming manuscript evidence for us. What doesn't help us in our culture today is that we live in a culture where the New York Times will make a bestseller out of the book, The Da Vinci Code, written by Dan Brown. And in fact, you might remember that book. You might even remember the movie that came out. But what those books do is they do no justice to the mountain of manuscript evidence that we have. And they do no justice to the lifelong scholarly work that's been put into this very question. And so what's important for us to understand about the manuscript evidence, the first thing that's important for us to understand is that there was meticulous and extreme care taken in how the Bible was copied. Extreme meticulous care. For example, the, the scribes were the ones who copied the Bible down. And they were like very, they, they, they wanted to make sure they got it right. So they had certain rules you had to go by. Certain rules, like it had to be done in a certain way. As you copied from one scroll to the other, it had to have like 48 to 60 columns and it had to be 30 letters wide because they wanted to make sure when you would check it later that it came out right. They had other rules, like you had to copy it letter by letter. You couldn't go like word to word. You had to go letter by letter. Because you know, like sometimes when you send a text, your phone will make a text word prediction. And if you're not careful, you're not paying attention, you could send the wrong word. Well, they wanted to make sure that nothing like that could happen. So the rule was we go letter by letter. They had rules like you would know the number of A's in a scroll. So they would know in one scroll, they had 1,653 A's. And as they got done making this copy, they would count all the A's. And if they got 1,654 A's, it was gone. Because they had to make sure it was right. They knew the middle letter to the Pentateuch. Not the middle word, the middle letter. That's the, that's, the Pentateuch is the first five books of the Old Testament. They knew the middle letter to that. And they could count forward and backwards. And if it came out wrong, that scroll was gone. They wouldn't use that one. Now we hear things like that and we go, why were they that meticulous? Why were they that extreme? Well, they wanted to make sure they got it right. They believed this was God's holy word. They were doing their very best. They were like engineers today. They were doing their very best to make, make like a Xerox copy of it. Now the other thing you need to understand about the manuscript evidence is that we have a whole scientific field based upon the accuracy of the Bible. It's called textual criticism. And it's made up of Christian scholars and non-Christian scholars. And they'll look at all the manuscripts, they'll compare and they'll contrast, they'll date them, they'll debate with each other, they'll argue with each other, and they do this over thousands and thousands of manuscripts. Just for the New Testament alone, we have 5,366 manuscripts or fragments of manuscripts. And some of them are like this picture from the Gospel of John. Now, what makes this one very unique is that scholars believe this one was written about 25 years after John wrote what they call the original autograph. That's very important. Because scholars speculate it's quite possible that whoever wrote this copy down was actually looking at the very original autograph of John's gospel, 
which is very rare with ancient writing. What's also unique about this one is this one was found in Egypt. And so scholars believe that John's gospel was very widespread early on, which is significant because that tells us it's highly unlikely that myths or legends or fabrications entered John's gospel because it was so widespread, everybody knew John's gospel. So no one could be like, no, that, that's part of John's gospel. <laughs> that's not part of John's gospel. We know John's gospel. Everybody knows John's gospel. It was so, so widespread that it protected the integrity of his gospel. Now, let's talk for, oh, I also forgot to say, that, that one you're looking at, there's no errors in John's gospel. No errors at all. What you're looking at is exactly like we see with John here in your Bible. There are no errors in that one at all. Let's talk for a moment about ancient literature. We have less than 700 of Homer's Iliad, less than 700. And we have only a handful of Aristotle's works. And scholars would say those are all reliable. They're all accurate. And we have thousands and thousands of manuscripts for the New Testament. I mean, you can't even compare in terms of legitimacy because what we have so far outweighs anything else with ancient literature. Now, our Old Testament manuscript evidence, it's not quite as extensive as our New Testament, but it's still very, very powerful. The oldest surviving ancient Old Testament manuscript is called the Codex Leningrad. Codex Leningrad. Codex means book. Leningrad is the city in Russia, so that's where it's currently located. And Codex Leningrad is a great phrase to use at a dinner party. <laughs> and so we're going to just say that together. In just a moment, on the count of three, we're going to say Codex Leningrad. Ready? One, two, three. Codex Leningrad. Very good. All right, so the Codex Leningrad is the entire Old Testament. The entire Old Testament, and scholars dated at about 1008 AD. And all the major translations of the Old Testament depend upon this particular manuscript. And it was uh, written down during the Masoretic period. This is when, for several hundred years, Jews were very meticulous in how they copied down the Old Testament. What makes the uh, Codex Leningrad so significant is that it's exactly like the Old Testament that you have right now. There's no major differences at all. Now, for some of us that are kind of newer to this discussion, we might hear that it was dated at 1008 AD and kind of go, that's disappointing. I wish we had something that was older. And that's fair because, you know, we, the Old Testament books were dated so much further back, right? They were written so many, like thousands of years ago. But what you need to understand is something very important happened in Israel in 1946. Something that made worldwide news. Something that most of us probably heard. The Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered near the Dead Sea, which happens to be one of the lowest places on the planet. It also happens to be one of the driest places. And a shepherd boy was exploring some caves and he threw a rock into a cave and he heard some pottery shatter. And he ran and got his dad and what they discovered was the single greatest archeological discovery ever made. They found hundreds and hundreds of clay pots filled with scrolls that scholars date back, listen to this, this is very important. They date it back to 250 BC. That's about a, over a thousand years older than Kodax Leningrad. And so can you imagine what the scholars did when they got a hold of the Dead Sea Scrolls? They immediately started to compare the Dead Sea Scrolls to Kodax Leningrad. And you know what they found? About a 1% difference in biblical integrity. A few names got misspelled. This is huge for us. This means from 250 BC to 1008 AD to your modern Bible now, there's basically zero loss in biblical integrity. You have a very, very reliable Old Testament. And as I said, the New Testament manuscript, the evidence is so much stronger. So much stronger. The oldest and most complete New Testament manuscript is called the Codex Sinaiticus. 
Codex Sinaiticus. And in 1840, the leading biblical scholar was a man named by Constantine von Tischendorf. I know, he got beat up a ton growing up. <laughs> and he's near Mount Sinai, and he goes over to this monastery, and he sees that these monks are using paper and fires to keep warm. And he sees what's going on and he freaks out because he knows they're burning ancient documents. And he pleads with them, he begs, you gotta stop. And they stop. And they show him this back room filled with trash baskets with ancient documents inside that they were planning to use as Kindle to keep warm. And so Constantine saves the Kodak Sinaiticus. He saves it. And what's significant about this one is it's dated at 325 AD. Now, it's the entire New Testament. The entire New Testament. 325 AD. In fact, you can look on it online today if you want to. You can Google it. You can zoom in on it. You can see that it's done in Koine Greek. What's really important, too, is that the Codex Sinaiticus is exactly like your New Testament that you have today. No major errors at all, none. And so what we see with Kodak Sinaiticus, what we see with Kodak Leningrad is that God was watching his word. He was watching as it went through the generations. The God who supernaturally provided the Bible also supernaturally preserved it. It's remarkable when you think about it that God was working behind the scenes to make sure that you could trust that your Bible is indeed true. Now, I'm aware that there's probably some people here thinking like, yeah, but there's gotta be some mistakes. I mean, come on. You mean for all of these years there hasn't been like one little mistake that's been put in there? Well, there have been some mistakes, but we catch them. They're caught it's not like the mistakes have been in the Bible like forever. Let me give you an example of probably one of the, the greatest mistakes that we caught. It happened in the 1600s when King James gave one particular family the printing rights to the King James Bible, the Barker family. And they had printed thousands and thousands of copies of the King James Bible. And then in 1631, they made a mistake with the seventh commandment. And it said this, Thou shalt commit adultery. <laughs> As you can imagine, that got quite a stir. And so they collected all those Bibles. Some of those were burned. Some of them were destroyed. In fact, only nine of what they call now the wicked Bible are actually still around. <laughs> In fact, one of those was just sold at an auction not too long ago and it sold for $50,000. So Barker, Mr. Barker, was unfortunately thrown into prison, had to pay a huge, hefty fine, and his family lost the printing rights to the King James Bible. But the point of that story is, yes, there have been times when there was a mistake, but we catch them. We catch those mistakes. Proof number two that the Bible is true is that the Bible is historically accurate. The Bible isn't just right about doctrine. It's not just right about theology. It's not just right about ethics and morals and values. The Bible is historically accurate, meaning it's based in real time, real places, with real people. How do we know the Bible is historically accurate? Well, just like you would know anything is historically accurate. You would base it off the test of good history. And one of the best tests of good history is did it come from an eyewitness? And the Bible is made of primarily eyewitnesses. Moses was there when the Red Sea split. Joshua was there when the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. The disciples were in the upper room with Jesus when he came back in his transfigured body. I mean, Matthew walked with Jesus for three years in his public ministry. He wrote it all down. Same with John. Luke interviewed as many people as he could possibly find, including Jesus' mom, and he wrote it down. Simply put, 
The Bible is primarily eyewitness accounts. This is a strong argument for the case of the Bible being reliable. It's made primarily of people who saw these things happen. Listen to how John puts this. John wants to make this point very clear that what he's writing about, he saw, he heard, he touched him. Listen to how John puts it in 1 John chapter one. We proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. He's the word of life. This one who is life itself was revealed to us and we have seen him. And we now testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal life. He was with the father and then he was revealed to us. We proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard. There he goes again so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that you may fully share our joy. Now, I'm aware there might be some people here that go, that's great. Okay, I get that. But how do we know for sure that the gospel writers were completely honest? Like, how do we know for sure that they were completely honest? That's an important question. For example, it's not uncommon for an eyewitness to leave out certain parts that might be maybe a little embarrassing or hard to explain or it might be embarrassing to someone else. And so when that happens, every then, everybody can then kind of go, I'm not so sure this account is accurate. It makes sense. Well, that particular question actually steps into one of the wheelhouses of the defense of the New Testament. The Bible is filled with things that scholars call the hard sayings of Jesus. Things that you and I would never include if we were making up our own religion. For example, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. We would never put adultery at the same level as having lustful thoughts in your heart. And you might be thinking, yeah, but there's other demanding statements in other religions. Yes, there are. But what makes this very unique with the New Testament is that there are several places where the teachings of Jesus would take a lot of explaining. For example, in Mark chapter six, it said that Jesus could perform very few miracles in Nazareth because very few people believed in him. And so that makes you wonder, was he all powerful? In Mark chapter 13, it talks about how Jesus says, uh, nobody knows the day or the hour of my return, even himself. And so that makes you wonder, did he really know everything? You could look at the disciples. They're not the heroes. I mean, here's a great example, Peter, all right? Under the pressure publicly from a middle school girl, he denies his relationship with Jesus. He's like, I don't know him, uh -uh. don't know that guy, three times. He's the ringleader. He's the one that Jesus said, upon you, Peter, I'm gonna build my church. James and John asked Jesus, hey, can we have the best seats in heaven? Can we sit to your left and your right? Even their helicopter mom got involved in the question. <laughs> All right? Oftentimes the disciples are shown as self-seeking, self-serving, and oftentimes dull-witted. Now, if the disciples, the gospels of, uh, or the writers of the gospels said, that's gotta stay in. Even the stuff that was embarrassing, even the stuff that was hard to explain, doesn't that tell us something about their credibility? They could easily said, I gotta take that story out. I don't want that one in there. Can we please take it out? But they're like, no, we need to be completely honest about what happened. So why would we believe that they weren't completely honest about everything else? By the way, we don't have any historical basis to think that they were lying. Not with what happened in their lives. Not with what they went through. 
So another important thing to understand is that it's not just based upon eyewitness accounts, but good history is based upon archaeology. Luke, a historian as well as a doctor, wrote down the book of Acts. He records it. He refers to 54 countries, 39 cities, nine different islands, all with complete historical accuracy. One of the great things about archaeology is it shows us that our own views of history can be wrong. That the Bible itself has proved at times that our own views of history are wrong and the Bible has proved itself to be right. Let me give you a great example of this. There was a time when people, scholars thought, we're not so sure Solomon was real. And they had all these different reasons for thinking that way. And one of them was, well, there's just no way he could possibly have that many horses. They were like, "Ah, in that region, we're not so sure. And they all thought that for a long period of time until they got to this tell. And tell is a fancy word for an archaeological site. And they're at the tell of Megiddo, where they discovered Solomon's chariot cities. And they found thousands and thousands of stalls for guess what? Horses. The Bible proved itself to be right. Maybe one of the greatest examples of this is with the empire of the Hittites. For a long time, scholars were not so sure they could trust the Bible because the only place where they read about the Hittites was in the Old Testament. But they couldn't find really anything else about the Hittites. And so this kind of created a lot of doubt about the Bible's reliability. That is until the early 1900s when a professor by the name of Hugo Winkler discovered... 10,000 clay tablets at Bogoskoy. And guess where Bogoskoy is? At the former capital of the empire of the Hittites. Now everyone believes in the Hittites. In fact, during a break in the game today, you can jump on Wikipedia and read all you want about the Hittites. This is probably my favorite story about archeology span because it was a place I actually got to go to on a cornerstone Israel trip. There's this Galilean village called Magdala. Some of you might know, or that might sound familiar to you because you've heard stories of Mary of Magdala. Well, for a long time, archeologists couldn't find anything about this little village. And it created a lot of doubt about the Bible's truthfulness because it's referred to a few times in the New Testament. Well, a couple years ago in 2009, a group of Catholics bought a little piece of land uh, in the Galilee, and their goal was to create like a little retreat center. And so they were gonna put some restaurants and some shops there, and they started to lay the foundation for a restaurant. And as they begin to dig, what do they find? Magdala. Well, there goes the restaurant. All right, and then what they discovered next is remarkable. They find this fish market. They find this fish processing plant where scholars speculate that Andrew and Peter probably cleaned and sold fish from. They find all these houses. They find streets. They find a village. And they find a synagogue. And as you'll see from this picture taken from my phone, scholars believe that it's very possible that Mary of Magdala walked on the very tiles that you see in this picture that her and her family probably walked on those as they were growing up, going to the synagogue. Scholars also believe, there's not debate over this, scholars believe that these are the very mosaic tiles that Jesus probably stood on when he taught from this synagogue. So, what this shows us is that archaeology proves to us that the places in the Bible, they're not made up. This is real stuff. Like real, like you could jump on a plane today and you could go and see all the places recorded in Acts that Paul went to. You could go to the pool of Siloam and see where the blind man was healed. You could go to all the places, all of uh, Herod's palaces and you can go visit them. We dug these places up. They're real. Now, I've been fortunate enough to go to Israel several times in my life. I highly recommend you going if you can because God will use that trip in a very powerful way in your life to grow your faith in a very kind of unique way. 
Because if you can go on a trip like that, you're gonna hear your tour guide say something to the effect of where you're standing, somewhere in this vicinity, maybe five miles away, maybe even a mile away, this story took place. And then they'll read that story from the Bible. And when we think about that, it's pretty remarkable that scholars and can look at manuscripts and they can dig up things out of tell and they can like put all this together and they can kind of pinpoint where something in the Bible took place, even though it happened like thousands of years ago. And then you'll go on these tours and you'll go to a place like Antonia Fortress. Another picture taken from my iPhone and you'll hear the tour guide say, scholars speculate that somewhere in this vicinity Somewhere in this area, maybe a couple hundred yards from here, that Jesus was held as a prisoner before his trial in front of Pilate. And that's powerful because you begin to see like, this is real stuff. And then you'll go into the fortress and you'll hear your tour guide say, there is no doubt among scholars that where you're standing, and I have a picture of this, that scholars agree that you're standing on the very ground that Jesus was on when he was brutally tortured by the Roman soldiers. And that's a powerful moment. That's like a goosebumps moment because you begin to realize that you're standing on the very ground that Jesus was on when he began to pay the penalty for your sins. And God uses that in a very powerful way in your life. He begins to like speak right to your heart, right to your very soul, even your psyche. And he's telling you in those moments, what you believe in with Jesus, this makes sense. That what you believe in with the Bible, this isn't made up stuff. These places are real. You could walk the very streets that Jesus carried his cross. You could go to the very place at the hill of the skull where they crucified Jesus. Is the Bible true? Is it reliable? Can we count on it? I believe that the manuscript evidence, the eyewitness accounts, and archaeology show us that you can say what I believe with Jesus and what I believe about him from the Bible, my faith in him, it's well-placed, very well-placed. That's it for today. That's the foundation. We'll talk more about this next week. Let's... Let, me, let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we come before you as a community of faith, grateful that you've preserved your word, that we can see as we look back on history how you were involved in the process, that you wanted to make sure that we could have a sense of real trust, that what we have in the Bible, it's true, it's reliable, it's historical, that this is, makes sense to believe this. And so God, do that good work in our hearts, that good work that only you can do. We open ourselves up for your Holy Spirit to work in our lives in such a way, not so we can use this information to beat people up. Not so we can use it in a way that might be offensive, but in a way where we could go, God, thank you. That was helpful. That was good for me to hear. And so God, we ask that you do that work in us because we know you're good and we know you love us. We pray this in the powerful and awesome name of Jesus. And everybody said,